It is a great honor and privilege today to uh, have Stephen almost today because uh, you've been doing this many, many years, but for the last 17 years, you're focusing on craniofacial pain, sleep disorders. So walk us through this journey. You got out of school at USC in 1981. What made you 17 years ago um, decide to focus on craniofacial pain and sleep disorders? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very unique niche in dentistry, is it not? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially um, putting those two things together. So, uh, you know, I started out like uh, every other general, general dentist doing all the de- different uh, procedures. You know, uh, uh, at USC, we were taught uh, perio quite extensively. So we did full flap surgeries. We were doing implant type things. So this is the old days of uh, blade implants and self-periosteals and things like that, um, restoring them. Uh, you know, crown or bridge, full mouth rehabilitation, um, all the cosmetic things. I did all of those things for a number of years. And, uh, but like everybody, you run into these situations where people are having pain. They, nobody seems to know what to do with them, uh, you know, and uh, it was a struggle. So uh, just wanted to learn more and started that aspect of trying to the treatment for pain. Then, uh, you know, as uh, you get more and more involved and find out that uh, there isn't real good reproducible uh, solutions, um, you know, you start searching for answers. So I started to have some success, um, started to educate myself. In fact, um, I went through all the various academies, took uh, all the board certifications for pretty much every dental and physician-based organization that exists, and, um, uh, you know, started to put it all together. And once I started to have some success, I uh, sold my general dentistry practice to my uh, associate at the time and decided I was going to take a year off and just locked myself in a room and studied everything I could and went around the world and uh, looked at what the experts were doing and uh, came and put together a protocol system that uh, I created. Um, Then uh, really got an emphasis uh, on understanding how uh, breathing problems are the precursors for a lot of the orthopedic problems and neuropathic things that we treat and headaches and all that. And uh, now we've created a system uh, that uh, we now have 32 centers uh, today. I think by the end of the week, we'll have 35 centers in six countries. We have them throughout the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I was just in London, England uh, two weeks ago, opening our center there. there. Um, And uh, we'll be opening an office in Dubai uh, in September. Um, and so I was just talking to one of the gentlemen who attended my lecture at the UK two weeks ago from Ireland, and now he wants to do a center in Ireland. So we're, we're constantly expanding, and we're at uh, also we're in university. So I'm at uh, the University of Tennessee. I'm adjunct professor there. We have a center there. We treat patients. Um, also at Rack University in the Middle East, uh, and we're also starting courses at the University of Queensland, Australia in 2016. So um we're, we're affiliated with different universities, uh, Boston University Orthodontic Department. I was just there lecturing at Harvard uh, about two months ago, and I'm on a task force at the University of Pacific. So we're integrated into the dental schools as well as um, out there in private practice. So um, quite involved in this process. It's been a quite a big, big journey. And every townie's fantasy would be if you would just put a complete online curriculum on Dental Town that just covered this from A to Z. Have you, have you ever thought about that? Uh, well, I've been teaching these uh, protocols for the last, uh, I think, uh, 12 to, to 15 years now. And yes, we have standardized protocols that we teach uh, through uh, the universities. Uh, our next program is at the University of Tennessee starting in September. And uh, yeah, I've been doing that for a number of years. That's where people come in contact with us. But um, I would love to uh, put uh, program, programs together and get that word out through Dentaltown. I think it'd be I, tremendous. I, I would love to. And I, I think it'd drive a lot of traffic to your courses, too, because we, we just passed 200,000 members on Dentaltown. We put up uh, 330 or 340 courses, and they just passed 550,000 viewings. So you would be teaching this stuff from Kansas to Kathmandu if you put it online. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Wow, that's amazing. You've created a tremendous network. Congratulations. Well, I didn't do it. It was all Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so um so basically um you want to start with TMJ or sleep disorders? 
Well, you know, TMJ, the orthopedic problems, are um, actually a subgroup of craniofacial pain. Um, uh, you know, the neuralgias, broken nerves, um, the uh, facial muscle, uh, muscular stuff is kind of all inclusive. But headaches are in there, too. Primary headaches, you know, uh, the idiopathic ones, uh, migraine, tension-type cluster headaches. That's also inclusive in craniofacial pain. So, um, you know, uh, what I've come to find out is that, quote, TMJ problems are really a symptom problem. They're, uh, they're not origin problems. Unless you got a, a macro trauma, you got in a motor vehicle accident, you got hit in the face with a baseball bat, that's different. But um, in the people that didn't have those traumas, very often uh, it's uh, repetitive trauma. And usually breathing has, or, or the dysfunctional breathing has something to do with it. Most often it's uh, nasal blockage. In fact, I just uh, published... Uh, an article in the Journal of uh, uh, Orthodontic Practice uh, just uh, two months ago identifying the four points of obstruction using CBCT so that people who are treating these kinds of problems would know what to look for on x-rays to see where the obstructions are. Because sometimes it's just nasal valve, sometimes uh, you know the nasal uh, component is blocked with uh, large turbinates or septum problems or whatever. And we look at all those points with the soft palate uh, and the base of the tongue to determine what needs to be involved and who we need to refer to to get efficacious treatment. So, well, you, you know, on the message boards, we have 50 categories, and one of them is TMJ. And on, if you start a post, um, you can, if you have, you have that article in a PDF, you can upload uh, the PDF into the post uh, so Dennis could read it and then uh, start discussing it and commenting on it. Oh, beautiful. Well, I will, I will make sure we get, get that out there today. Yeah, that, that, that would be amazing. So um, explain to someone, um, what do you mean by craniofacial pain? Uh, craniofacial pain is all the pains in your head. Uh, sometimes people hear the term orofacial pain, but if you break it down, that means uh, mouth and face. Uh, craniofacial means, you know, the things inside your head, too, and that means headaches. So when people think of TMJ, they think of headaches, and, of course, they're quite related um, migraines, tension type headache, cluster, the worst headaches uh, that exist are inflammatory headaches. So those are inflammations of the trigeminal nerve plus inflammations throughout your body. And that's why if you get an MRI, it would be negative. You know, you don't have a tumor, you don't have bleeding in your brain, you have inflammation. And so basically it's about determining where uh, and what are the things that are producing it. And that's, that's what we do. We find origin. And what, and what, is, and what would be the low-hanging fruit categories? I mean, stra do, do you, you, you said you've been around the world, and I know you've been around the world because just your uh, website, TMJ Therapy Center, you spelled center instead of C-E-N-T-E-R, you spelled it C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, very European flair, right? That's, yes, <laughs> I did that early on when, when we were only in uh, San Diego. It's quite is, funny. Is, is spelling center C E N T R E is that French or is that British? It's yeah, it's it's it's, it's English, British. Uh huh. Br the British do that, right? And all the Commonwealth countries, you know, that we're in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, all in the same vein. But yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I didn't have that idea when I started this. I had no idea that I was going to be duplicating what I do around the world. I just thought I was going to practice in San Diego and have a great life. Uh, funny, I, I actually thought I was going to semi-retire. I thought I'd go to work, I'd ride my bicycle, I'd, I'd uh, go into work for a few hours, and I'd do this as semi-retirement. I had no idea what... what uh, what life uh, had in store for me. <laughs> so these centers, do you, do you own the center or they just use your protocol or how, how, when you say they're your centers, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, what we mean is that we have a standardized delivery system. And uh, so all the centers have been personally trained and mentored by me. We have a network where we all communicate with each other on cases. Let's say you're in uh, England in, uh, or Australia, Australia and you want to post a case. Well, we've got 35 doctors that all do exactly what you do in the same protocols that give you a response immediately, as opposed to a lot of uh, forums that people have different opinions, different things, and it gets quite confusing. Uh, we have a very, very extremely standardized system with very high results. And uh, no, they're all privately owned. Uh, they're, I, I will own two of them, uh, the San Diego office and the Dubai. Um, so it's kind of a mix uh, in the future. We're going to be uh, assimilating with uh, the London Sleep Center, 
which is a physician-owned uh, center. And uh, our protocol will be uh, that we work directly with the sleep physician and our centers will be inside them. And I think that's really what the future lies for us. So it's really quite exciting how we hope to uh, standardize the delivery system. So, so go through the major – so, so you've been around the world. I mean some people say that headaches are far more common in the 20 richest, most stressful societies – and far less common in the 50 poorest countries. Do you believe that? Um, certainly headaches are quite common. There's no doubt about it. Um, whether or not it's directly related to stress, I don't agree with that at all. In fact, the literature does not support that. Um, that's a common uh, uh, wives tale, if you will. Um, I think that uh, truly the problem is is people's inability to deal with stress. Uh, most of these people are so fatigued from uh, such disturbed sleep that when they wake, they're so exhausted. Very often they're treated for depression uh, and these kinds of, uh, you know, mental uh, or what we call access to problems. Um, and the reality is literature shows that um, uh, a lot of these people, uh, when they're diagnosed with these depressive components uh, and those that are, uh, have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, for instance, it was a paper that was just published last year in the um, uh, uh, HEODO, um, the um, American um, uh, Academy of Dental uh, of uh, Dentofacial Orthopedics, uh, and uh, that study showed that uh, they took a group of people who had uh, depression and OSA, treated them successfully for the OSA, and basically relieved them of the depression and the cardiovascular components as CPAP would. Um, and other, a, a more recent study just came out in the oral facial pain and headache shows that uh, they really can't find uh, anxiety component that's high in there. So I think what you're finding is a lot of people that are just beat down and they just have a very, very low tolerance. So any little thing pushes them over the edge, like some stress, like a little dehydration, maybe they miss a meal, things like this. They just basically have a low tolerance for everything. So the simple way to point the finger is at stress, but that's uh, really more and more literature is coming out uh, just weekly on um, that's really countering that thought process. Well, you say wife cell, but it, you know, 28 years of, uh, um, you know, that's the problem I have at 52. I got to delete a lot of the stuff I learned in 87 and 90. But back in the day, I mean, you couldn't throw a cat at a TMJ lecture where they would say there's more wear facets in people in the United States and Korea and Japan than there are in laid back societies like, say, Jamaica. Do you, do you, do you agree with that or do you not agree with that? Um, uh, well, there, if you look at the correlation between, if we want to talk about bruxism, um, it's correlation to um, some kind of central nervous stimulation. Uh, bruxism is a movement disorder. That means something has to stimulate the central nervous system. And very often what stimulates your nervous system is not breathing or, or not breathing properly. So uh, which countries are going to have a higher incidence of those things are going to be the industrialized countries, the ones that eat higher refined diets with lots of sugars and things like that, with increased weight, um, also greater blockages to breathing, and uh, they're going to have higher um, oral motor activity problems. So uh, when you look at bruxism, uh, it's basically two kinds of bruxism. There's primary bruxism, which is idiopathic, which means that uh, it is in the absence of a medical disorder. Uh, and then there's secondary bruxism, which is usually idiopathic. It's secondary to the medications that we give people for problems. I'll give you, for instance, uh, like uh, antidepressants, uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are prescribed for people that have depression. Well, they cause you to grind your teeth. So very often these people have headaches and grinding of their teeth when they're prescribed for depression, which is very often the secondary result of not sleeping well. So these things actually compound sleep because those drugs shorten sleep, lighten sleep. And, uh, you know, what happens is these people now have a more disturbed sleep. So you, you, you just compound the issue with, with this kind of thought process. And I think when I ask most dentists, you know, when you're treating a patient with a night guard and I ask them, well, what are you treating? Oh, I'm treating bruxism. Oh, OK. Are you treating primary bruxism or secondary bruxism? That's usually where they get confused. Because they say, well, you know, obviously don't know the answer. And I explain to them, well, primary bruxism means in the absence of a medical disorder. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is a medical disorder. Have you screened them for OSA? 
because uh, usually this is not the case. And we know that night guards um, given to patients who have obstructive sleep apnea make their apnea forty uh, percent, uh, excuse me, fifty percent worse forty percent of the time. And uh, and so we have numerous studies showing that night guards given to patients who have apnea worsen their apnea. So this is a very important point that we know what we're treating. And quite honestly, dentists should know that bruxism is a medical disorder. It's a movement disorder. So truly, that should be diagnosed by a physician. And where we diagnose that is in the sleep lab. So that's one of the things I would really love to see changed is how we go about um, treating people that grind their teeth. Well, give, give them the, the details um, of how to screen uh, for a sleep disorder. Would you recommend that they get a referral pad to uh, an, an outsource that uh, to a sleep center? Or do, would you recommend that they take more training and buy a machine and send them home with a kit and come back and give you their report? You know, there's some take-home uh, devices that you can buy. What, what would you recommend? Well, I, I certainly think all dentists need to be uh, educated on sleep disorders. In fact, that's my mission and why I'm at the University of Tennessee right now is because we're t uh, training the undergraduates. I want dentists coming out of school to actually be educated in this and how it relates to a lot of the dental problems that we treat. Uh, but in answer to your question, I think it's imperative that the dentist refer to the physician because only a physician can diagnose whether a person has a uh, breathing disorder, uh, whether the difference between snoring and obstructive sleep apnea or upper airway resistance or whatever their problem is. And, um, and there's so many other kinds of sleep disorders besides that that I think are really important uh, to get them over to a specialist. So in this way, uh, yes, they should. It's proper to make that referral. Now, what should a dentist look for? Here's the interesting thing. Um, the dentist should look for people that grind their teeth. That is one of the biggest, biggest, uh, uh, you know, things to look for. Another, scalping of the tongue. Scalping of the tongue is 70% predictive of OSA. Um, tongue that is, uh, uh, that is above the occlusal plane. Um, a blocked uh, oral pharyngeal airway. If a person opens their mouth, sticks their tongue out, and you can't see an air hole, that's likely a person that has a breathing problem. Okay? And all of your patients that have open bites, posterior, anterior, those are all people with breathing problems usually. And these are all things that dentists see all the time. Um, in fact, uh, it was published in a physician journal um, just about two years ago uh, where um, it was identified. Uh, Dennis Bailey wrote the article for um, Dental Sleep Medicine, and uh, it was a uh, uh, what to look for by the dentist. And, and uh, it was kind of funny, coated tongue, uh, many of the things that dentists treat every day. Uh, periodontal disease it has a very, very strong link to obstructive sleep apnea. Um, uh, attrition to teeth, as I mentioned, ab fraction lesions. Uh, basically, most of the things that dentists treat have a relationship to breathing problems. In fact, if you look at studies that in the general dentistry practice of what, what what's the average number of patients, you know, in a general practice? There was a study published in um, uh, sleep about uh, three years ago. Uh, two general dentistry practice in San Diego here were screened for uh, obstructive sleep apnea for their adult patients. They found 33% of the males and 7% of the females were positive for obstructive sleep apnea. That means they needed to be treated immediately. And that's not talking about the people that snore and have all other kinds of problems, of which obviously there's more of them. So think about it. 40% of the average dental practice has a treatable problem, but are we really treating 40% of our patients? And, and that's just adults. I haven't even talked about children. So again, you have equally as many or more children that have the problem because those people as adults usually didn't develop it as adults. They've had it their whole life. It just gets worse the older you are. So you said 33% of males and 7% of females? Correct. Why, why would males be, um, I mean, that, that's four times higher chance if you're a male versus a female. That's right. Um, has to do with uh, uh, neurology, has to do with anatomy, has to do with um, tonus of the muscular walls. Uh, basically, the reason why uh, adult humans are, are the only mammals to have apnea is because we can speak. Uh, we have a difference between our epiglottis and our soft palate, or uvula. Um, in, in babies, we can suckle and breathe simultaneously. All other primates can. 
But as an adult, around 18 months, the uvula descend, or ascends and the epiglottis descends, and that muscular tube in between, that's how I'm talking to you right now. So that, in a male, uh, is an area that, uh, A, accumulates more fat. Um, so the heavier we are, men, we gain fat in our throats and our bellies, women, hips and thighs. Post-menopause, that changes. So we see a higher incidence of females that have apnea after menopause. As things change, their testosterone goes up, their estrogen goes down. And um, so men are predisposed neurologically. They're, they're predisposed um, in, a, in anatomy. And as we lose tonus over, over time, our airways become more flaccid and they close up. And that's why we see greater and greater apnea events the older we get. So there's lots of reasons why men have greater problems than women. Is one of them the fact that that man is living with a woman? Is that <laughs> well, that, that's how he easily gets <laughs> identified. The, the reason why a lot of guys come in is because they have bruised ribs from their wives elbowing them all night, you know, uh, and getting them to turn over because, uh, you know, th that's kind of the hallmark thing. You know, what are some of the symptoms? Well, People that wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, you know, that's a hallmark symptom of apnea, you know, because uh, I have apnea, and this is what I try to explain to people. I, I weigh the same as I did when I was 20 years old. I haven't gained weight. I exercise, eat, do, try to do all things I can. But the point is, is here I am at 60 years of age, and I have apnea, and I couldn't be thinner. So when they say it's a problem of overweight people, it's ridiculous. That's not true at all. It gets worse the heavier you get, but you have the problem. It's neurologic. So here I am awake, speaking to you right now. I'm not stopping breathing, talking to you. See, I only stop breathing when I'm unconscious. So there's a neurologic component to this. There's a difference between daytime and nighttime. And that's something we've never really understood in dentistry. We make appliances, one, usually one kind of thing for day and night. We don't understand. Neurology is different. Function's different. Breathing's different. Everything's different. So we have to understand those counts. Those, those kinds of things to be able to treat properly. And I think that's uh, an important point. I think one of the things you're saying that is the most shocking, in fact, we should figure out a name for this for this podcast. Are you saying, Dr. Stephen, almost that when before you make someone a night guard, you should always send them to a sleep uh, physician to see if it's sleep apnea? Or would you go to that extreme of a statement? Absolutely. Um, okay, if, that is just not done. I mean, out of the 125,000 <laughs> general dentists, I know. how many of them do you think screen you for sleep apnea before they make you a night guard? I don't think many. And here's another question. I, mean, I, I, I don't think 99% do. I, I would agree with you. And that same group of dentists, how many of them were educated in dental school on how to treat apnea? None. The same 99%. Right. 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 So that's my point, and that's my mission in life, is to make sure that quality and standard of care for all patients is elevated, that we just don't do things, that we just don't cover up symptoms. You know, what, what's the process with a night guard? What, to protect the teeth while the person suffocates every night? So when they die, they have nice teeth? I mean, come on. You know, we, we have, we're doctors. We're supposed to be looking at the whole patient here and understanding that we're, we're not helping that person. You know, we're not doing anything from, yes, we're covering up some of the symptoms, but the big symptoms, you know, like uh, hypertension, this sort of thing, it's the silent killer, right? So we're contributing to that. And uh, that, I think, uh, is based on our education or lack of it. You know, a uh, study that was published in Sleep just uh, two years ago, where they polled 58 dental schools in the U.S., and they said, how much education is being given to undergraduate dentists in, in this field of sleep? It was 3.92 hours for a four-year program, so less than one hour per year is given on this sub subject. And that's now, and that's not 30 years ago when I went to school, okay, so, or <laughs> greater than that. So, you know, that's really the point, is here we are today, we're still doing the same things, what have we really learned? See, and, and that's why if you go to all the books uh, of all the icons of people who teach TMJ and this sort of thing, as you identified, and inclusion based techniques, Where's the chapter in there on sleep and, and sleep disorders and breathing? Because I haven't seen the chapter. You know, I keep looking for it, but I haven't seen it. And I think that's the huge missing piece here. And the elephant in the room is, is that I don't think we really have a good idea what we're treating. I think we, we're, we're covering up a lot of stuff and the answers are there. Uh, literature is there. 
Um, we just need to change our education base. So, so doing what we're doing right now, Howard, you and me are changing the face of dentistry right now because we're sharing this stuff. And I give you so much credit. This is really an amazing thing you're doing because it's grassroots. We're getting that message out. And uh, it's a very, very important message. Well, if we're changing the face of dentistry, I think we should use a picture of your face, not mine. <laughs> so sure. you, you said before – a doctor makes someone a night guard. They should send them to a sleep physician and get them screened for sleep. Um, um, but you also said periodontal disease is related to sleep apnea. And I bet you some guy driving to work almost hit, hit, hit the wall saying, what? Periodontal disease from P. gingivalis. How could sleep be a factor in periodontal disease? Oh, simple. Uh, just the simple fact of uh, mouth breathing. Uh, nasal obstruction is one of the biggest problems of uh, disturbance of sleep. And you, you can, uh, that's why alcohol, uh, you know, disrupts sleep. Well, one of the big reasons um, is that it causes swelling. You, your, your nose is lined with erectile tissue. So when you, you know, introduce something into the body that, that inflames it, it's one of the first things that closes up and swells and you start mouth breathing. The mouth breathing changes the complement of the bacteria in your mouth, and this is why we have such a problem with, with, with dry mouth, don't we? That's why we have all these lubricants and we have all these different xylitol sprays and things. Uh, it's the same kind of situation we have when we're treating irradiation situations uh, and the dry mouth that, that results from that. So um, we understand the mechanisms. We just never really uh, thought breathing was that big a deal. You know, a dentist just discovered that people needed to breathe, what? 10, 12 years ago, before that, we never thought people had to breathe. Uh, we never thought that there was an issue with that. So in, in general medicine, 25 years ago, didn't think that, uh, never investigated. So we're, we're at our infancy here, and that's why these things are so shocking to us. What, what, what do you think explode? I've, I've wondered that all the time. How come, what really happened 10 years ago, or you said 12 years ago, to make sleep and everybody, I mean, you, you, you see articles all the time in every B2C magazine, TV shows. Um, what do you think um, brought this to light? Well, I think it answers so many of the questions that we are struggling with. You know, why do people, in fact, you know, how did the whole industry develop? It, it developed with psychology. You know, uh, this, that psychology is the, is the area of medicine that identified sleep breathing problems. Uh, you have people who have all these psychological disorders are trying to find the reason why. So they investigate their sleep, thinking maybe their dreams and this sort of thing might have something to do. So they develop these uh, sleep studies. Well, once they started looking at their EEG activity and all this sort of thing, they realized these people stopped breathing. And once they did, then they started to bring in the pulmonologists. And this was the origin of all the sleep uh, programs and studies that we have. Uh, that's, that's, that's how it got started. So from there, it started to answer the question of, oh, well, now we know that all of the things you die from, the cardiovascular disease, that, that's what you die from. That's the number one reason why we die. That's directly related to breathing problems. And, uh, and, and so now in periodontal therapy, we understand, look at the literature. Uh, for years now, people have been saying, oh, well, cardiovascular disease is linked to periodontal disease. Well, sure it is. And guess what? Uh, cardiovascular disease is linked to obstructive sleep apnea and breathing disorders. So if we just go one more step, we'll have the answer to a lot of these things because when we treat cardiovascular, or excuse me, when we treat breathing disorders, hypertension goes down, cardiovascular disease goes down, plaque buildups, all these things go down. And as a result of restoration of normal breathing, we see uh, changes in occlusion, we see restoration of and stability of a lot of the systems that we're, we as dentists should be treating and are treating. Okay, so you said if someone needs a night guard, you would always send them to get a sleep study. How would you um, – would you say the same if they had periodontal disease, if, if a 50-year-old person came in with a mouthful of five, six, and sevens? How, would you always send a periodontal patient to, uh, to get a uh, sleep study, or, what, or would you need other clues before you would go that far? 
Well, you know, it, it's it's in addition to other things. Uh, periodontal problems are systemic problems. So in other words, we're looking at the whole body. So that's why they're looking for the link at cardiovascular reasons, this sort of thing. So if I had a patient with periodontal disease, I would look at the health history. I would say, does this patient have cardiovascular disease? Are they being treated for that? I'd look in their mouth. I'd say, is there wear patterns? Do they have attrition? Uh, do they have abfraction lesions? Do they have scalping of the tongue? Do they have all these other markers that I was talking about? And if they do, then the answer is, Yes, because again, going back to the night guard thing, okay, now I'd ask a dentist, you're going to make a night guard. Why are you going to make this night guard? Well, likely because what? You see worn dentition. Okay, now, why is there worn dentition? Something has to be going on for this to happen. The assumption that it's stress, well, I'll give you a reason for stress. If I suffocate you, Howard, you're going to wake up with stress. Your heart's going to be racing. You're going to be in panic. That's anxiety. We treat a lot of people in chronic pain with anxiety. And I always ask them, do you wake up with anxiety or does the anxiety come on as the day goes on? Because if you wake up with anxiety, there's likely something quite terrifyingly wrong with your sleep that is producing this situation. So, yes, the answer is if anybody's going to make a night guard, before you make a night guard, ask the question, are you treating primary bruxism or secondary? If you're treating primary, that means that they have to have no medical disorders, and that means you have to have cleared them for OSA. So the answer is yes. Now, if they're going to treat secondary bruxism, well, that's secondary to a medicine. And in those cases, then they need to contact the physician who's prescribing that medicine. And likely, there's uh, probably a sleep-related issue as well. So that's why it's imperative. Do you believe this uh, figure that you see thrown around in the media a lot that um – Americans are 5% of the world's population. There's 7 billion people. There's only 330 million Americans. But the 5% of the world's population, Americans take half of all the world's prescription drugs. Do you believe that statistic? Well, yes. The, the number one drugs that are prescribed are for depression. You know, we just don't appreciate the – okay, if you ask the average dentist, what's the frequency of bruxism? I think they would say it's quite high. So here's my point is that if, if we look at the uh, books that are written on the subject, Sleep and Pain, for instance, written by Barry Cecil, who's the editor of Oral Facial Pain and Headache Journal, uh, which is the journal of the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain. Uh, he also he paired with Gilles Levy, who's the dean of the University of Montreal Dental School, who happens to be the world expert on bruxism. I mean, uh, all of the best references in physician literature, use him as, an, as the exam example. He writes all the chapters. Now, can, can, can you email me, Howard, at dentaltown.com and CC him, see if he'll do a podcast on bruxism? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure oh, he Oh, I so want that interview if that's the guy. Oh, yeah. Um, he, he, um, so the two of them paired together, and their recommendation is in the book that um, – and the book is called Sleep and Pain, um, and um, I think it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. So they make this, they make this statement all to, to dental clinicians. All patients with uh, attrition or bruxism should be screened for obstructive sleep apnea. That's, that's their recommendation. That's from the experts. So – that's what I'm sharing with everyone else today and saying, well, you know, you really need to look at this because if your background is still thinking about 30 years ago and still thinking this is all stress, the literature, current literature does not support that. And I'm happy to supply you with lots and lots of literature on that subject. I, I think I think so much of this is so brand spanking new to so many of us older guys. I mean, you got to remember, I, I, when I got out of dental school, we didn't have computers. And, yes, sir. Uh, I, 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 I think this would have I, I think this have to be a very long curriculum on Dentaltown. I mean I don't I don't think you could teach this to anyone in one hour or two hours or three hours. I mean this is probably twenty five oh. hours to really explain this. Oh, I agree with you. Um, these, would you commit to something like that? I mean, would you would you do something like that? I'd be I'd be I'd love to help and spread the word and and, and share this information. In fact, uh, you know, the time frame that you're talking about, there's there's quite a bit of information. In fact, uh, you know, to one of our center owners uh, has been personally mentored by me. And it takes uh, concerted effort anywhere from 12 to 16 to 18 months of working with them to make them expert in this area. So, uh, you know, these are these are lots of lots of information on different uh, subjects. What, what if someone listening to this podcast from Kansas to Kathmandu wanted to have one of your centers what, what would their first step be 
Well, uh, I think they should uh, uh, come and listen to the information. The next courses we're teaching are at the University of Tennessee, and uh, they uh, in September. And I uh, think that that would be a great opportunity to hear and share the information if that's something they have good. Is interest. that is that information? Are those dates on your website? TMJ Therapy Center spelled British dot com. That is TMJ, correct. TMJ that is- Therapy Center spelled C E N T R E. Uh, all that information will be there? Absolutely. Also about our centers. Everything is on that website, yes. And so why was the only other one that you would own being Dubai? Just because that is just the Las Vegas of the Middle East? or No, no. It's just a paradigm shift. You know, from, from creating this network, my thought process originally was data collection centers. See, uh, Howard, we publish an, an, uh, from, from uh, a number of areas and uh, through the uh, – Boston University, uh, University of Tennessee, and uh, what I did, what I've done is I've created data collection sites. So now we can collect data, and we're publishing. We have a number of papers right now that are uh, in various uh, stages of uh, acceptance, and so uh, and we've published a number of others. So uh, that was the original thought process. Now, as I get older, and, and I'm older than you, uh, I am, uh, you know, thinking, hey, you know, uh, I need to uh, kind of branch out, and uh, so I'm uh, placing some of my centers and creating a whole new system, uh, as well as increasing the numbers of people who want their own private center. So we, we allow people to do what they want. Uh, they want a center, great. They want a couple, super. Um, and I'm doing the same in myself. So it's kind of a little bit of both. You know, we're giving people the option to do whatever they choose to. So America has about half the population living in 117 towns, and the other half is living in the rural and about 19,000 small towns. Would this center, would this probably only work in one of the 117 largest towns in America, over 100,000 people, or do you, do you think this could work in Colwich, Kansas? Anywhere. In fact, if you go on our website and you look at some of the places, you'll notice that some are cities and some are areas. Uh, in Canada, we have Eastern Ontario, but we also have Toronto. We have London, Ontario. We have a number of cities, Vancouver. Uh, you look in the United States, we have, uh, we have a whole state uh, well, can be a center, or uh, a, a, it's all based on population that's necessary to support it. Uh, and so it can be any of the above, and we have examples of that. We have, uh, um, you know, uh, centers in Utah. Uh, we have uh, centers in, um, you know, Chicago. We have centers throughout throughout the U.S. And some are cities and some are territories. So it's all based on population. Is it true that Canadians don't snore because it's not polite? <laughs> no, that's not true. They are, they are the most polite people in the world. I don't think you could ever find a country where the people are more polite. You talked about this related to periodontal disease, but it's also open. It's also related to orthodontics and open bites. Would Absolutely. You agree? Absolutely. Talk, talk about this with ortho. Oh, um, well, that, that actually was the topic of the paper that I was just speaking about, uh, the one that was uh, published in the Journal of um, Orthodontic Practice. It, it was about uh, relapse, orthodontic relapse. And so we were showing cases, if you look at the orthodontic literature, uh, lots of stuff where, you know, they've been, uh, you know, uh, most cases are actually fixated with some kind of retention wires and uh, or ortho, orthonathic cases that are that are bracketed together, um, they still open up. They still open up anteriorly, still open up posteriorly. Now, why is that? And what I was showing is that in all these cases of repetitive openings, uh, the commonality was uh, a nasal ob- obstruction. So they'll, people will go in and do these orthognathic surgeries, but they'll ignore the nose. And what they're essentially doing is ignoring the tongue. And you have 500 grams of force with that tongue constantly pushing on that bone, and that's what's developing these situations. So if people would just look at the nose and understand that that must be patent for you to have stable occlusion, that so often we've had situations of, of, of people's bite changing, and the, the origin of that was a breathing problem. And once we resolved the breathing problem, eliminated the changing occlusion problems, you know, so these are very, very common situations, and that was the article. And I will post that for everyone uh, to read because I think it will be very helpful for them to understand these mechanisms. And uh, I, I want to talk about something uh, It sounds crazy, but it's a really new thing in America. You had Colorado 
legalize. You, you we're having states legalize medical marijuana, and they're they're um, you're seeing these. A lot of people are getting the prescription for it for pain. Uh, and so since medical marijuana is so new, I just want to ask you this out of the left field. Do you think medical marijuana um, has a place for pain in, in the craniofacial area? Have you even thought about that? Or Well, yes. Uh, the American Academy of Pain Management, I'm a diplomat. It's a physician-based organization. Basically, anybody who treats pain of any specialty can join. Uh, you go to one of these meetings and, you, you know, here, I'm a dentist. I can have a chiropractor next to me. I can have a neurosurgeon on the other side of me. So, you know, it's basically anybody that treats pain. And they have been uh, hosting um, programs and uh, lectures on this for at least 10 years. Uh, on the efficacy of, uh, of marijuana use for chronic pain patients. So without a doubt that uh, it, it definitely has a literature to support uh, its efficacy. Now, how does that affect all the other problems? Um, well, uh, if you have apnea, you still have apnea, whether you smoke pot or not. Um, but if you look at chronic pain, um, what I think people are missing the boat on is how many people in chronic pain have a sleep breathing disorder. And that's what I'm sharing. We're, we're, we just submitted a paper from our, um, our centers and the University of Tennessee to the Journal of Oral Facial Pain and Headaches. It's being reviewed right now. And what we do for all of our patients is we screen them for pain and sleep breathing disorders. And what we found is, is that there's a correlation between jaw locking and, uh, and sleep-related fatigue. So, so for the first time, orthopedic problems of the jaw, which we thought were totally separate, um, when we combine data and look at sleep breathing problems, we're finding a correlation. So now we're starting to get the answers. Why, why is it all these people, you know, with these dislocated jaws, why do they happen? Well, very often it's because they can't breathe. And now we're starting to get better and better uh, research on that. You know, when uh, I got out of school, the big high-tech machine was a $85,000 Plan Mecca Pano from Finland. And now these kids, and, and you could see a little bit of airway going down on the sides of the pants. But now uh, a lot of people, myself included, uh, I just bought a, uh, a few years ago a CareStream CBCT. If someone has bought a CBCT, is this going to be a better diagnostic tool for what you're talking about? Absolutely. The two-dimensional uh, uh, evaluations that you were talking about with the plan mech and this sort of thing, you know, that's the 20th century. The 20th century was 2D. The, the 21st century is 3D. You know, when you talk about airways and you talk about all these structures, you have to talk about volume. I, I published the only paper that exists uh, in, published in a peer-reviewed journal on the bite registration technique as a starting point to prevent airway collapse uh, uh, for the treatment of sleep breathing uh, uh, appliances. And um, that was published in uh, Sleep and Breathing in 2007. Uh, and do you know that uh, these kinds of things are, are the huge omission in, in, in our education as our starting points? So we really, really need to look at that uh, because uh, I think it's a real important point that, that we understand those concepts. I, I think there's a massive uh, lack of education on even how to read a CBCT. It seems like the, the, the most information on it is from people trying to sell the machine, but once you buy the machine – when you go look for training on how to read a CBCT, that you're, you're, it's scarce. Well, that's what I do in my courses. And again, that, that paper I was just talking about, the Journal, of Oral Fa uh, the Journal of Orthodontic Practice that we were just speaking of, it's all, in, it's all how to read a CBCT. That's what the article is about. And um, uh, so I think that will be helpful to the people who have CBCTs on what to look for. And that was the point of writing the article. I want you to address, since uh, we're older and more mature, <laughs> to the uh, some to the a lot of the dentists in the community that are just a little far bit too anal. Uh, they get very mad when someone says TMJ. They want you to say TMD. Uh, I don't like the word <laughs> CBCT because why why are we going to build a brand called CBCT when the whole world gets 3D just from going to the movies? I mean, I think it should be we've gone from 2D to 3D. Um, you have TMJ. Every American knows what TMJ is. They, the TMD confuses them. And now the endodontists are getting mad when you say root canal. They want you to say endodontic therapy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, don't, don't, uh, am, I, am I being la intellectually lazy to say, look, the whole world knows what TMJ 
3D and a root canal is, why are we trying to take them to TMD, CBCT, and endodontic therapy? Or do you think uh, I'm wrong on that and, and being too lazy? Well, you know, it's, 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 a better, it's all about communicating, isn't it? So it's about getting your message across in the best way possible. And sometimes we have to change our delivery. Now, right, we have some patients we can speak to that have a good understanding. We can talk just the way we normally talk to another professional. Another patient, you might have to say, let me explain it to you this way. You know, you don't verbalize that, but you do change your delivery. So, in fact, the name of our centers. Now, I do not, uh, I treat many, many, many uh, uh, disorders in the head and neck. However, um, what do we call our offices? TMJ and sleep therapy centers. Why do we do that? Because that's what the lay people understand, just what you said. So I'm, you know, when you have to explain it, you have to do it in kind of a general marketing way. Um, and in regards to CBCT, well, um, the, the, the advantage of saying CBCT over CT is that a medical grade CT is probably 100 times more radiation. So it is good to define the difference because CBCT is only a fraction. Now, I use uh, imaging sciences units, ICATs, and, uh, you know, on the, on the smallest uh, uh, scan, uh, we can get, like, um, uh, you know, we, we, we can very much get the radiation down to probably what a pano is for most uh, uh, other kinds of machines. So this is very safe. Now, that's very different than a medical-grade CT. And I think that these are important points. So sometimes it is good to define the difference because we wouldn't want to think people uh, think that, you know, we're using these devices and, and somehow they're going to glow in the dark because they're getting too much radiation. In fact, that's the whole point. They're very, very safe. You know, I'm so old. My first CAT scan, they just brought in a cat and put it on the table and they just walked around <laughs> sniffing me. So so you said your, your CBCT was made from imaging sciences? Yeah, ICAT. I can, oh, I can't. I can't run. Yeah, it's the and imaging where, sciences is the, is the manufacturer of it. Yes. And where are they out of? Um, uh, Philadelphia. They're right here in the states. And what if what if a dentist was saying, okay, if I did this uh, type of center, what percent would you say your TMJ versus sleep medicine, or is it so blurred that you can't even separate it? Oh, it's it's blurred because we 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 treat every patient. Every patient that comes into our practice for chronic pain. We, 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 we uh, screen them for sleep disorder breathing problems. So all of the patients are getting sleep studies. And uh, we have such a high correlation between these that it is impossible to separate the two. Um, you can't do that. In fact, that is the point. Uh, uh, but I think if uh, a lot of these general dentists who start out wanting to do a center um, sometimes they, they love general dentistry. They want to keep doing it. We say, great. Uh, my criteria for success uh, of a center is, is that whatever percentage of patients they treat, any patients they treat for chronic pain or sleep are treated to the level uh, that I would treat in my office. And that's a standard that we have throughout. So whether they do 5%, 10%, or 100% of their practice uh, in treating this way, uh, it must be to that level. And I want you to go over that. If you were going to get into this and be at the level of your knowledge, how many different multidisciplinary doctors would you have a relationship? How many people, how many fields of specialty are you actually working with? Uh, well, uh, as many ailments as people have, but it, it boils down to um, the most frequent referrals uh, would be ENTs. Uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, primary physicians that we have to work through sometimes in order to get sleep studies and also to follow up and do blood work and this sort of thing. Um, chiropractors, osteopaths, um, uh, these are all physical therapists or people that we might refer to. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, and then there's uh, certain situations where we have some kind of abnormality that we need to work with uh, the specialists in dentistry, like the oral maxillofacial surgeons or any of the other specialties uh, that might come into play. Um, but, of course, uh, you need a network, and um, you need uh, like-minded people, especially when it comes to ENT surgery. Um, one of the big problems is that if you have an ENT that doesn't understand uh, how to minimally – uh, improve the airway, minimally invasive techniques that actually increase function of the nose, you can have a situation being made worse. So the old days when they just used to drill out pieces of your nose, and uh, uh, that actually makes things worse. 
And, and uh, I teach all of these things in the courses. You're asking where do people go. I, I give them all this information. Uh, perhaps it's something that we can develop together where we can share this, this kind of information uh, in this kind of format. I think it would be great. I would love that. I, I, I think it would be an enormous um, help to the profession. Um, I'm going to talk about – I'm just going to throw two more major diseases that we dentists on the front line see all the time, obesity, diabetes. Right. So those are directly linked uh, and uh, to sleep disorders because uh, metabolic syndrome is the direct result of interruptions of sleep. And what interrupts your sleep very often is uh, not being able to breathe. So you might have started out you know, thinner. Uh, your diet might be poor. So you eat a lot of carbohydrates. You know, the, the things that we were told, low-fat, low, low high-carb diets, sure isn't working very well for us. We're the fattest people on the planet. Uh, so the more your sleep's interrupted, the less you sleep, uh, the higher the circulating glucose, the higher circulating insulin levels, the more prone you are to diabetes, okay? And the more uh, you're, you have, you're interrupted from sleep, the more suffocations, if you will, um, that produces inflammation throughout your body. Now, sucking air through your mouth instead of your nose, as is proper, also increases its systemic inflammation. All of these lead to cardiovascular risk. So if uh, also hormonally, if you have interrupted sleep, then uh, what happens is you have an increase in leptin. Leptin's a hormone that's produced from your fat cells that tells you you're not hungry anymore. But the less you sleep, less than five hours of sleep, will, will now uh, have a constant surge of leptin. And what happens is, just like in type 2 diabetes, you have too much insulin, so your body downregulates and just says, you know what, I'm not going to even respond to this. In the same way, you have this leptin that's so great that your body says, hey, you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. See, what happens when you wake up? You're hungry. So you wake up hungry and you say, oh, I got to eat something. What are you going to eat? Carbohydrates. What's it going to do? Make you heavier. What's it gonna, how's that going to affect your breathing? Make it worse. Oh, so now you're in this cycle. People say, you know what? I'm going to work on my weight and then I'll do some treatment for that OSA. What they don't realize is if they don't fix their, their sleep, they have no chance of losing weight because they're fighting this hormonal problem. And so these things are all linked, and, and this is the message that we try to get out to the patients. I want to ask you, ask you one more, since you said the word hormonal. You said 33% of males um, had this versus 7% of females. But when we switch over to migraines, most of the stuff I'm reading says females have far more migraines than men. So why is it reversed with migraines uh, for women? Uh, or, or do you, first of all, do you believe that? Do you believe women? Absolutely. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. So to, what, to what figures? Can you uh, throw any numbers well, out? Women seek care for chronic pain, uh, jaw-related problems at a ratio of anywhere from seven to nine to, to one over men. And there's a very good reason, testosterone. Testosterone mitigates pain and reduces inflammation. So therefore, men go farther with problems. See, men just die. You know, they don't have a lot of symptoms along the way. However, women, because they're more inflammatory, women have more peripheral pain receptors. Women have uh, more uh, fluid edema. See, they swell more because of estrogen. Uh, women have more complete transmission of pain because of estrogen. So they have more pain receptors. They transmit pain more. They have more fluid edema from the same injury. Small wonder why they seek care at a greater ratio. They feel more pain than men in the same, with the same injury. So women are symptomatic. That's why they have these problems uh, in terms of headache, which is an intracranial swelling of the vessels, of the blood vessels, from their whole vascular system is swollen. So that's inflammation. I have brought it down to four points that I uh, uh, bo basically boil down my treatment to. The number one thing is control inflammation. Two, control the parafunctional activity that produces this uh, activity and inflammation, specifically in the jaw, and when we're talking about craniofacial pain. And then we have to maintain proper breathing, okay? Proper breathing is through your nose. Every time you suck air through your nose, if your nose works properly, it draws nitric oxide out of your maxillary sinus, which lowers your blood pressure and is antimicrobial. So that goes into your lungs and prevents you from getting respiratory infections. That, that's proper. If you suck air through your mouth, you bypass that. And the last thing is nutrition. Because if people don't eat right, they're going to be they're going to have more inflammation, and the more inflammation they have, then they're going to have uh, greater breathing problems and greater head and uh, just greater pain. 
So these are the four points that I address uh, that are just the uh, of what my whole treatment prot protocols are centered around. And this is what I always tell people uh, in my centers and anyone taking my course. I say, look, you don't have to know what I know to be just as successful as me. You just have to follow the protocols. And by doing so, you will be successful and this will buy you time to assimilate the information. But immediately you will be successful. What is the what is the test for measuring inflammation in the blood? Is it a C1, AC1, or what, what is it? Uh, well, C-reactive protein, C -reactive is, protein. Is, is very often what uh, cardiologists are uh, looking towards. Uh, but that can be generated from any number of things. Um, you know, substance but but, but my, my question was, could that be an initial screen? I mean, could you have all you, you could have all this inflammation and disease and whatever without inflammation and wouldn't that raise your C reactive protein? So would a C reactive protein blood test be a baseline screener for everything we've just talked about or not really? Is that too overly well, simplistic? Well, uh, I would agree that every single patient who has those symptoms has high C reactive protein. Okay. But, um, I'm not sure that's the real value because we're not treating high levels of C-reactive protein. Uh, what we're treating are what we're treating is is the symptomology. So, give you a good example: a guy, 50 years old, comes into our practice. He's there because his ribs are bruised because his wife keeps elbowing him all night because you know he stops breathing. That's why he's there. Now we get him into the room. We take a CBCT of his head, and we find out that his jaw joints are all melted away. You know, this is so common. I can't be begin to tell you how common this is. So then we ask the guy, don't you feel anything? Is it, you know, your jaws are all gone. Doesn't that hurt? He looks at you and says, no, I don't feel anything. I can eat rocks. That is so common. See, men just aren't inflammatory, but they have the same, they, they have structure breakdown. Um, but if you look at it, um, uh, studies have shown that women actually grind their teeth more men uh, actually uh, have greater wear, okay? Because women become inflammatory and uh, seek treatment. Men don't. And so their destruction becomes greater. That's why you see a lot of guys with their teeth completely worn down, jaws worn down. But if you ask them, do you hurt? They're like, no, I don't have any problem. It, it's, they don't know until everything stops. And those guys, I can guarantee you, likely have a breathing disorder. We just we just had something happen in Arizona last week, and it hardly even made the news. And I've been wanting this my entire life. I, I always thought it was uh, uh, abusive that an individual American couldn't order a blood blood test on themselves without going through the payment door of some doctor oh. ordering it. And Arizona just passed law says you want to walk into a center and and get tested for whatever it's, it's legal now. And I thought, man, that is a hundred years overdue. And, uh, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, yeah, it, I, just, I just thought that was abusive. And, and on that note, I, I still just really irritates me. I'm trying to think about it because it always makes me upset that I can't, um, you know, my, my elderly patients, a number one cause of death is pneumonia or the flu, and I can't give them a flu shot even though the literature is saying they see a dentist, they see the 150,000 dentists twice for every time they see the 1 million physicians and I can't give them a flu vaccine, but they can walk over to Walgreens, and <laughs> was, a pharmacy tech can do it. I was just going to say and that. And then yeah. with oral cancer, someone dies every hour of oral cancer, and I, I can't give a HPV vaccine or, you know, but I really think we're going to rapidly become physicians of the mouth if dentists listen to more people like you. And you know who's hurting us the most it's the dentist on the state boards. That's who you need to do an all-day lecture to. I mean, you ask these, I don't want to call them morons because I have to go before them, but my God, they're the ones voting against us, giving an HPV vaccine, a flu vaccine. It's like, dude, you're supposed to be on our team. <laughs> I mean, I, we see the Americans twice as often as the physicians, and you're not and, – and then the big billion-dollar insurance companies won't even cover for an oral exam. Could you imagine – the, what Obama would go through if Obamacare wouldn't cover a woman's uh, screening for uh, uh, uterine cancer or vaginal oh. cancer. But my insurance companies won't even pay for an oral cancer exam, a flu shot, an HPV vaccine. I mean, am I a dental lab tech or a doctor? I'm uh, asking you, what am I? I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, um, what I do is actually I, I treat medical problems. In fact, Howard, I haven't billed a dental insurance in at least uh, 17 years because 
we only provide medical treatment. You see, I treat problems, uh, chronic pain disorders. I, I treat orthopedic problems of the jaw, and I treat sleep breathing disorders. Those are all medical problems. So I only bill medical insurance. And so what we're really saying is we need a new category of dental physicians as opposed to what we've been categorized before. And I couldn't agree more with you in all of the statements you made about here we have these untrained people doing these things. You know, we're certainly better trained. However, we do have some lapses. And where we're, our lapses are is in the treatment of medical disorders. That's why I'm in the schools right now trying to educate the newer dentists to come out. Uh, and you're right, it's upside down. Uh, what makes the dental school curriculum? Are people that have been out of dentistry for so long that are that are setting basic standards and have not been exposed to any of the material you and I have talked about for the last hour. So it's upside down right now and couldn't agree with you more that we need a flip-flop and get people who uh, are the most educated into the administrative uh, positions, but it is certainly upside down right now. Yeah. We're, we're, we're averaging about 7,000 listeners on these things. What if someone's out there wanted to ask you a question or are you – available like that? How, how could they talk to the man? Well, um, I'm happy to, to, to speak to people. You know, it's you difficult. prefer email, phone, go to your website. What, what do you recommend? Well, actually, I think the person who's uh, best able to get them information or uh, connect us together would be June. Uh, and in fact, uh, just June, J-U-N-E at T-M-J therapy, T-H-E-R-A-P-Y center, C-E-N-T-R-E.com is the perfect uh, way to get a hold of me. Now, now, do you own the website TMJ Therapy Center, spelled C E N T E R dot com? Yes. You do own that? Yeah. So if you go there, it logs over. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and by the way, I think June is one of the most amazing people I've ever. I've known her for thirty years. That woman is just. She's a hygienist. Uh, she's she's from Canada. Now she lives what in Detroit or or around. No, she's still in Canada, but, but, the, uh, but just in, across the way from Detroit, yes. Uh -huh. And Detroit's the only city in America you drive south to Canada. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that? Did you yeah. know that? Yeah. yeah you yeah. actually cross the bridge. <laughs> you're, you're headed straight south to Canada. Uh, but uh, I, I, I really hope you commit to some online C courts because this is something that you, you just can't take a dentist and get him up to speed on this on an hour or two hours. I mean, this is uh, this is going to be like you said. You, you, you closed your practice and lock yourself up in a room for a year to get at your level. And this is, this is going to be a major change in our profession. And uh, you're at the forefront, and it was just a huge honor uh, that you spent an hour with me today. Thank you so much. And I hope to see uh, more of your information on uh, Dentaltown, and uh, I thank you so much. Will do. And I appreciate your, this opportunity, Howard. Uh, you're doing a tremendous service. Thank you. All right, you have a rocking great day, and tell June that she's the bomb. <laughs> okay, I will. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.